Every American president puts his stamp on foreign policy. Some redefine the whole global system. With a year and a half left in his mandate, how to characterize Donald Trump? Joining us now on that, in Washington, D.C., Walter Russell Mead, distinguished fellow at the Hudson Institute, professor of foreign affairs and humanities at Bard College, and the Global View columnist at the Wall Street Journal. And Walter, you have been too long, too absent from our airwaves, so it's good to see you again. How are you doing? Great. It's great to be back. Let us start off with a clip from Donald Trump's speech to the United Nations, which took place last September, and that will kick off our discussion. Mr. Director, if you would, please. Each of us here today is the emissary of a distinct culture, a rich history, and a people bound together by ties of memory, tradition, and the values that make our homelands like nowhere else on Earth. That is why America will always choose independence and cooperation over global governance, control, and domination. I honor the right of every nation in this room to pursue its own customs, beliefs, and traditions. The United States will not tell you how to live or work or worship. Walter, two and a half years into his presidency, can we say yet that there is something called the Trump Doctrine? You know, everybody talks about doctrines for American presidents, but really when you think about it, and very few of them actually have doctrines and the special doctrines, and the doctrine usually covers only one thing. So the Carter Doctrine is, we'll protect the Persian Gulf. Um, you know, is there a distinct Trump approach to foreign policy that is, you know, sets him off? Absolutely. There well, certainly is. Well, Michael Anton, who's a former deputy assistant to the president for strategic communications, tried to articulate what a Trump, a Trump doctrine, rather, might consist of. And here's how he put it. Let me read this uh, as he mm. wrote in Foreign Policy, and then I'll get you to comment on it. In declining to act in their interests, Western and Democratic countries create opportunities for unfriendly powers unashamed to act in their interests, to exploit what they see as Western naivete. This observation forms the core of what one might call the negative formulation of Trump's foreign policy. The president himself has an inelegant, but not inaccurate way of putting it. Don't be a chump. Is that the essence of Trump's foreign policy direction? Uh, uh, you know, he's a, he's a very hard man to sum up. Uh, and Trump, I think, doesn't so much operate from a set of, you know, principles and worked out intellectual formulas. He has a set of instincts uh, so that if you if you watch what he does over time, you see patterns emerge. But he doesn't uh, he's, he's not a foreign policy intellectual. What can I say? His his goal is not to um, pull all of his thoughts together into some kind of a coherent intellectual approach. Also, one essence of Trump's method is to keep the other people guessing. Hmm. So even if he did have, even if there were some consistent way of predicting what he would do, he would try to hide that from you rather than showing it to you. You do say there are patterns that emerge. Uh, yeah. For example, what, give, give us a pattern that you've seen emerge. All right. Well, something that may well be related to, to some of the stuff we've been talking about is that uh, he definitely d he does not like the idea of subordinating U.S. sovereignty to any kind of transnational organization or, or multinational institution. Uh, he tends to think that, which, which, is, which is different in post-World War II American foreign policy thinking, he thinks that actually the United States loses more than it gains when it participates in something like the World Trade Organization. Um, you know, he, th he says, look, at trade, the United States, we're, the, we're such a very large market. Uh, if we were in bilateral negotiations with all of these countries, that would actually increase our bargaining leverage. While if we go through this WTO process, we're one of 200 voices, and actually our advantage is we're constrained by the forum. So he, um, he, he definitely thinks that rather than the key American interest being to set up institutions that can assure smooth governance, America should pursue its interests 
much more in bilateral forums. Hmm. Let me read you one more take, this one from the American conservative, and I'll, I'll get you to weigh in on that. If the core of Trump's foreign policy is not to be a chump, that can't account for why he has repeatedly given U.S. clients in the Middle East whatever they want in exchange for nothing. It doesn't explain why he walked away from a non-proliferation agreement that was working exactly as intended and proceeded to wage economic war on the country that was faithfully adhering to the agreement. It definitely doesn't explain why he has gone out of his way to insert the U.S. into a neighbor's internal political crisis in a push for regime change that has nothing to do with American interests. The list could go on, but the point is that Trump has opted for policies that impose costs on the U.S. without having anything to show for it. Okay, let's get into this. Tensions are clearly mounting with Iran. More troops are being sent to the region as we speak. Uh, Daniel Larison, who wrote this piece here, is he right to suggest that Trump doesn't have very much to show for all his bluster? Well, he doesn't have much to show that Daniel Larison wants. You know, um, uh, Trump, I don't think, would describe his situation. There certainly, though, as a, you know, as a, as a professor of foreign policy studies, I would give Trump an incomplete at this point. We don't know how these things are going to turn out. But, you know, on, let's, let's take the Iran question. Um, for Trump, the, uh, you know, being a chump, that would be his description of the Obama administration's approach to Iran, uh, where the real problem that was destabil, you know, the, the nuclear progress of Iran is a problem. It's a serious one, but it's also linked to um, Iran's regional adventurism and basically it's, it's, it's attempt to destabilize the Middle East and create a new order, Iran-centric order in the Middle East. Uh, because so many Sunni Arabs uh, hate and fear Iranian power, because uh, Israel hates and fears Iranian power, it actually it destabilizes the Middle East when Iran advan advances regionally rather than stabilizing it. Hmm. And so Trump's view, I think, was that um, it was a mistake to set us, you know, in a sense, give Iran a pass and, in fact, give it extra resources to pursue its regional policy uh, for what, what turned out to be a temporary halt to its, you know, what was designed to be a temporary halt to its nuclear program. Mm -hmm. That this was a, you know, it was a well-intentioned, now this is me talking, not the president, it was a well-intentioned uh, agreement forged by, you know, and diplomatically quite complex and, and I, I would even say in some cases brilliant, but it, it, it was intended to stabilize the Middle East and I think, I think the administration is right that it had the opposite impact. So getting out of that deal is causing problems mm. and may well cause more, but the deal itself was actually making things worse. Mm. Well, having said that, uh, he gave an interview about 30 years ago and talking about himself in the third person, as I guess he would be wont to do, this is how he imagined a foreign policy approach, again, three decades ago, under a future Trump presidency. He said he would believe very strongly in extreme military strength. He wouldn't trust anyone. He wouldn't trust the Russians. He wouldn't trust our allies. He'd have a huge military arsenal. As we fast forward and consider the accuracy of that statement, he seems to pretty clearly have changed his mind about the Russians who he seems to trust more than his NATO allies. He seems to love autocrats a lot more than he likes leaders from democratic countries. Do you agree with his assessment from a, a few decades ago? The, the sort of Trump-Russia thing strikes me as a little strange in that if, if, if Russia could design American policies, all right, they would certainly stop us fracking which by reducing uh, oil prices significantly reduces both Russia's leverage and its ability to act in the world. Hmm. It would really try to prevent us from doing a major military buildup or any kind of nuclear modernization because again, those strike at the core of Russian power. And so there's, there's absolutely no signs that I can see of Russia taking a pro-Trump line or Trump actually doing anything that helps Russia. So I'm not quite sure, you know, I mean, I, I understand all this sort of election dynamics and people, you know, sort of con confecting um, stories of conspiracy and all of this. But if you actually look at what's going on, um, they're really, you know, U.S.-Russia relations are bad 
and the two powers are consistently pursuing interests that undermine each other. No, those are very fair points, but I, I guess I would say many people are, are um, confused about why he seems curiously uninterested in the fact that Russia is trying to manipulate the outcome of American elections and, and that kind of thing. Now, admittedly, that's not necessarily foreign well, policy, I, I but it's I, I just read a story in the New York Times that said that uh, apparently, American cybersecurity has been putting all kinds of malicious code in Russian uh, utilities in order, you know, and one of the things in the, the newspaper article anyway said about this was this was to deter Russia from interfering in the election. So, again, I think there's just so much kind of rhetoric and emotion and uh, you know, invested in all of this. It's, it's actually it's, it's hard to have a serious conversation about what's happening. Okay, fair enough. Let's, uh, I, I wanna talk about Andrew Jackson for a moment here because uh, Trump, uh, even though he's a Republican, fancies himself a modern day Democratic president, Andrew Jackson. He's got Jackson's painting hanging in the Oval Office and you are somewhat responsible for that, I think. Can you tell that story? Well, it is a kind of a strange story and I, you know, uh, I started getting some texts on my phone uh, soon after Trump became president and they were uh, it said you know hi this is Steve Bannon can we talk and uh, you know I was trying to figure out which of my friends was pranking me on this <laughs> um, but it did turn out that actually uh, Bannon wanted to have a conversation we talked apparently Steve Bannon had read my book Special Providence where I talk about different schools of American foreign policy one being Jacksonian and he uh, uh, said that he thought that that was a good description of, of Trump's foreign policy. And so he had gotten Trump, he didn't say that he'd gotten Trump to read any of my books or articles, which I, I would doubt the president has done, uh, but that uh, this, he, he got the president interested in Andrew Jackson, the president visited Andrew Jackson's and, uh, home in Tennessee and then put up this portrait. So. There's definitely a sense, at least on Mr. Bannon's part, that this administration is trying to pursue a Jacksonian approach. And the essence of that is what? Well, it is now we're you know now that we sort of got that Russia business out of the way. It is that that it's realist. Uh, it is that countries pursue their own interests. You should follow your own country's interests. Allies are good, but you can't, you know, you can't really trust anybody else other than yourself. Um, that you do need a very strong military, but your goal is not to go out and conquer things. Your goal is to protect yourself, to have a military so strong that others won't attack you. So it's, it's not an expansionary, at least beyond the continental U.S., it's not an expansionary idea, but it's very definitely a vigilant and unilateral idea. Let me get you, if I can, to sort of think about what's in the heads of the 40 to 45 percent of the American public that has consistently supported Donald Trump since he came to office. What do you suppose they want from him in his approach to foreign policy? It's a good question, and I should first of all make sure that that uh, the readers understand it. I had to tell Steve Bannon this, by the way, I said, uh, Steve, I, I did not actually vote for the president. I voted for Mrs. Clinton. So um, let's, you know, I'm, I'm an analyst here, but I'll try to channel for you uh, the way some of these folks think. Uh, part of it is there's tremendous disillusion with the, these Hamiltonian and Wilsonian ambitious order builders. That is, you know, if you can go back to the 1990s, what they said about NAFTA was, NAFTA is going to make everyone rich in America, create a lot of jobs, and it's also gonna make Mexico rich and stable and democratic. And you look at Mexico today, none of that has happened. And you look at the United States, and while economists will argue that, that some very good things happened, and I think you can point to some, you know, for a lot of average people, the, the benefits of NAFTA did not appear, and now they're seeing sort of, you know, the Mexican frontier as a crisis area and so on and so forth. This was not a success, they're saying. And then look at China. 
all the all the people said, you know, all the establishment people, the responsible people, the well-educated, well-credentialed people told us free trade with China in the WTO will make America rich and China democratic. And again, what they see is nothing of the kind. And in fact, many people in the sort of, quote, establishment have now been completely reassessing China and saying, well, actually, what we did was empower the rise of what is becoming a very hostile and dangerous country. Hmm. So there is a, a total lack of faith that the, quote, establishment has the slightest idea what it's talking about. And then if you look at things like the war in Iraq, from the war in Iraq to the invasion of Libya, again, why should anyone ever listen to anything a member of the Council on Foreign Relations has to say about anything? Hmm. That's a kind of a default position now among, you know, Bernie Sanders voters, by the way, as well as among Donald Trump voters. Well, at the risk of oversimplifying this, there, there seem to be two camps, basically, in foreign policy today. One is that Trump... Uh, has precipitated and wants to disrupt and maybe even destroy the liberal international order. And the other is that he's sort of a reflection or a manifestation of that which was happening already. Uh, if I can oversimplify like that, which camp are you in? I think, I mean, I, I, look, I think he is a disruptor, but I think he wouldn't be there if we were under, dis if we weren't already under some disruption. Hmm. Um, you know, I personally think that what we're going through now with the information revolution is as disruptive and transformative as the industrial revolution. And if you look at what happened in world politics, say between 1830 and 1950, you look at the way states changed, you look at the way politics changed, religion changed, the family changed, cities changed, it was a sweeping and often tumultuous, chaotic, and from time to time, extremely bloody transformation of virtually every human institution and relationship. Hmm. And, it, you know, when I hear all these people talking about, oh my gosh, technology is changing everything and it's accelerating, but then they believe that, oh, and, you know, 30 years from now, politics will look more or less the way it does now. Our institutions won't change. Our, you know, basic economic and political ideas won't change. That strikes me as kind of crazy. Hmm. We are actually, you know, after World War II, I think we had a sort of a mature industrial age economy and system. But that system is now being disrupted much as the sort of mature pre-industrial society was disrupted. In which case, um, and at this point we have no clue which of the two dozen people running to challenge Trump next time out is going to win, but do you imagine that the Democratic candidate is going to be running on some kind of foreign policy platform which includes reestablishing America as the leader of the free world and, you know, with an attempt to influence events far beyond its shores? I mean, I, you know, that sounds like something that anybody could say, but would mean very different things by it. Hmm. Uh, I'm, you know, I imagine Donald Trump would, would say that was an excellent description of his own foreign policy. Um, you can interpret it lots of different ways. But, you know, certain things I think are changing in American foreign policy uh, and politicians, political leaders have to respond to them. One of them is clearly we're moving from an Atlantic-centric foreign policy world to a Pacific-centric foreign policy world. And that just reflects not just the rise of China, but generally the rise of Asia. And when the Atlantic, in the Cold War era, when the Atlantic was the core of, of international order and American foreign policy, um, European nations are very comfortable with the idea of institutions and um, and sort of formal procedures. But if you go to Asia, while there are certainly a lot of international institutions in Asia, they work quite differently. And managing and working within an alliance system that includes Japan, uh, Korea, India, Australia, Indonesia, these are, these are very different countries. They're, it's not the same, you don't just simply translate the ideas and the foreign policy of Europe in 1975 to Asia today. Hmm. 
So there will be changes, but, and, and at the moment, the, the thing that has struck me the most is while there's a lot of disagreement in the United States over all kinds of foreign policy issues, um, the sense of which there's a kind of a, on both the left and the right, a sense that China now is a much more important element for American foreign policy to deal with. Also that the China policy that we've pursued since the 1990s did not yield the results we hoped from it. Oh. So China's big and our China policy has to change. My guess is that will be on both sides. Okay, let's finish up on this. We, we started to see under President Obama and certainly more so under President Trump now that uh, America doesn't want to be the policeman of the world anymore. And certainly under President Trump, it has become much more of America first in terms of its foreign policy approach. Is that here to stay, do you think? Regardless of who's the next president, is that here to stay? Uh, again, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, what, what do we mean by America first? And if you say it, Obama, I think, President Obama, um, well, first of all, you'll never get anybody getting elected president of the United States who says, and if I'm elected, I pledge to put America second. <laughs> or I pledge to put America third. No, fair I don't enough. even think you could become prime minister of Canada that way. True enough. Um, so, uh, but President Obama, sh I think if you look at his foreign policy, um, the, the degree to which he was not taking uh, and getting engaged in things that past American presidents would have, the Syrian civil war is a clear example, but even something like Brexit, during the Cold War, if a British prime minister had announced, I'm going to have a negotiation with the EU, and at the end of that, we're going to have a referendum in the UK over whether or not Britain stays in the EU, the US would have immediately started working very heavily with both the British and the Europeans to make sure that, that the offer that came out of the EU-UK negotiation was one that would win a referendum in the UK. We sort of didn't think that Brexit was a very big deal for the United States, which is to say there was an indifference to European politics that, again, during the Cold War, no American president from either party uh, would, have, would have accepted. Hmm. So things have changed in the United States. That doesn't mean that a Democrat would have the same sort of harsh tone that President Trump does. Uh, but it does mean that that there is, a, you know, that, that since the American people have withdrawn their consent to some degree from establishment foreign policy ventures, they simply don't believe if you say, oh, I'm going to build democracy in X by sending in an army. Very few people on either the left or the right think that's going to work or w are willing to trust you. Uh, so. American presidents will be working in a new political framework, but at the same time, American power may actually be greater than ever in the past. So it's an interesting combination. Less political room, but more international power. That's Walter Russell Mead from the Hudson Institute, from Bard College, and you can read him in the Wall Street Journal. Walter, it's always great having you on TVO. Thanks so much for your time tonight. Great. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.